Well, guys, <clears throat> for the uh, first thing of the morning on the Thursday Grand Rounds over Zoom, I kind of chose a little bit more of a selfish topic. Wanted to review my own, uh, I guess, case log in the last four years. As you know, it's uh, has been already four years since graduation, 2019. Just feels like not so long ago we were there giving our speeches. Time flies. So I am about to hit a thousandth case. I think either this month or maybe we're at the end of the month. But uh, pretty significant kind of a milestone, I believe, uh, at least in my life. And it was a great opportunity to look back and see what uh, what exactly have I done. This is what my six-year-old boy, one of the twins, is asking. Papa, are you the best spine surgeon? And how do I answer that? I can't say yes, because first of all, it's not true, but it's a teach humility. I can't really say no. You know, he's a young, impressionable kid. He still thinks of me highly, and I don't want to bring that down just yet. I'm sure there will be a teenage years for that. So what do I answer? I don't know yet. Anyway, so let's take a look at the uh, thousands case, uh, close to a thousand cases that I have done by now. And uh, first I'm going to just give you an outline of uh, all the cases that I did. And then we'll go over the cases that I took back to the OR, because that's the main topic of this kind of a review to see what kind of patients come back to the OR. Is it something you know, I did wrong? Is it I didn't do right? I just want to make sure that, you know, that loop is closed and uh, moving forward, maybe I can adjust some things. So right now you can see that uh, in the last four years, I got, I've only had 20 cranial cases coming from trauma chunks. That puts me at about what 2% being a, a brain surgeon. Well, if Dr. Marcus is done, he would say that it's directly proportional to a uh, number of brain cells I personally have. But I don't mind that. This is great. This is exactly how I want it to be. The rest are all spine cases. And then you can see that uh, TR, even though I thought I see a lot of TR patients, only seven surgical. <clears throat> when it comes to the uh, cervical spine, that's where uh, a lot more cases are coming in here. You see about 250 overall cervicals, uh, split anterior cervical, 145, nine of which are uh, ocean preservation arthroplasties, and uh, 136 some kind of a fusion cases, ACDFs or odontoid screws. From the uh, posterior, 37 laminoplasties and 16 laminectomies with 50 fusions. So that's about 50-50, I guess, turned out to be a, a decompression versus fusion. And uh, seven intradural lesions, different types. So that's, uh, that's my, uh, I guess, cervical practice. Uh, I put little no case, uh, notes here, notable cases for me where uh, I had two cases of forestier disease where cervical osteophytes were overgrown, getting in the way of swallowing. And those were interesting, just uh, not reaching the spine. A lot of work was done around the bone, the joints. And uh, we're working on the project right now, hemilaminectomy for uh, intradural lesion resection. Uh, Turkey is currently Heading that. When it comes to thoracic, uh, 94 total thoracic cases. 20% um, I guess of that is untethering, steering management, uh, CSF repairs, uh, spinal cord herniation, ventral herniations, 21 tumors, two dural AV fistulas. So in four years, only two fistulas. So I guess they don't come that often. Uh, and it's surprisingly seven kyphoplasties. <laughs> You think uh, there's a lot more compression fractures that could be treated with uh, cement placement. But in four years, only seven people that I found would benefit from that. Uh, 17 general laminectomies and 31 fusions of different sorts for uh, a body deformity, gliosis, or uh, traumas. And here, uh, these numbers do not include the degenerative of uh, thoracolumbar pelvic He's surgery. actually doing that. I know. No, his is next to the. He didn't check. He, he's just taking. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, over here in this area, I think what I've been using differently maybe is the uh, Striker Spine Jack system. And that's really, it looks like a car jack mechanism that elevates end plates. And so far, I had a good run with it uh, as opposed to the uh, uh, balloon kyphoplasties. And also, we've been pushing the lateral. Um, are you taking these? Comfort level. 
So I think right now our record to get in lateral in the thoracic spine is up to T4, T5. I remember coming out, I was told that T7, T8 is the upper limit due to um, the scapula and the shoulder. We, we found a way to position patient where we can reach all the way up there. And uh, it's pretty exciting. Now, lumbar, I guess that's where most of the cases are happening. Uh, overall, 181 decompressions. And uh, as you can see, uh, 63 ipsi contra surgeries where the unilateral approach is used and both sides of the canal are decompressed. Thing I learned from Dr. Wang and from Dr. Levy. Mm -hmm. And then talk about the M&Ms and all of that. As you see, a lot of those patients do come for uh, during our presentations of uh, morbidity and mortality. 61 microdiscectomies, 44 just general laminectomies, including some little cis resections, a couple of level laminectomies, single foraminotomies. Uh, earlier on, I tried the Coolflex device. Uh, I think implanted six in total, but was not happy or did not feel good uh, about the overall the outcome, but whether or not it was making a difference. So I just stopped. And then se seven lumbar hypoplasty, again, with spine jacks. Uh, and 10 tumor cases, different sorts. Uh, here, notable for the um, uh, decompressions, we've been exploring with MAC anesthesia, and VA has been very helpful with that. Uh, Jackson Morris is also very open minded about it. The anesthesia team over there is very supportive. And we did publish a paper comparing our MAC anesthesia cases from those places versus uh, same surgeries or same type of procedures at Jackson with the uh, anesthesia, showing the time benefit. And, uh, Victor Lui did a good job with that. And now when it comes to fusion, I guess there's a thousand ways of doing it, and there's an evolution that happened, at least in my practice. Coming up, you can see a lot of tea lifts that's in blue bars, uh, 32 tea lifts overall that I've done in the four years with a dying trend. You can see how that blue bar slowly uh, trails up. Uh, and now it, initially it was my go-to move for any um, one level spondylosis, spondylolisthesis as an MIS approach. And now I still use it, but more if it's sort of a bigger posterior construct where an inner body needs to be placed. Uh, Alus, more or less uh, stable throughout. I guess that uh, in the white parentheses, older by years, 2019, 2020, 2021. It seemed in 2020, I hadn't done any alifts, probably when the T lift was at its peak. And I was trying to fix everything with the T lift. And now it's uh, even distribution, any single level L5S1 um, disease that can be targeted with alif, it gets alif. And I think uh, more or less, maybe that's unique uh, to me. I feel like uh, there's been a lot of laterals and I've been relying more and more heavily on the lateral approaches. So you can see direct lateral, which is uh, traditional x lift, you know, teaching 70 cases like that. But then uh, as I was um, getting the situation of high crest or difficult to reach in a retrieval disk space through the direct approach, I started to look more and more into oblique access points, first by doing anterior to crest, deviating a little bit from the uh, straight line and then going completely oblique and really reaching the L5S1 in the, uh, in the lateral position. And you can see there's uh, 46 surgeries like that. 37 of them were um, L5S1 approaches, which is already even more than the a lifts I've done. The L5S1 so far, uh, all of those approaches were uh, done by us. We don't rely on uh, exposure surgeon and thank God no, uh, no major complications. And then the rest of the cases, which I hear 62 cases of fusion done in prone. And those are usually bigger surgeries where a lot more decompression work needs to be done, osteotomies, uh, and, and just bigger fixation constructs. Or prone laterals. Um, and then I thought I did a lot of T10 to pelvises, but it turned out only seven patients got the full thoracolumbar lumbar sacral pelvic fixation for me. It's not that big. But again, look at the graph, overall trend for the lateral and obliques on the uh, uprise, the t lifts slowly diminished and the uh, probes are kind of stabilizing. And of course, don't forget my uh, sacral pelvic practice, Travis. I did coxygectomies initially, and it's just turned out they're not worth it. But so we did three in total. I don't think I've helped anyone. He never got away and 
and I was still convincing everywhere else. Very difficult for me to uh, to agree on that right now. That I would do another one. Uh, two uh, tumor le le uh, lesions. Three already tricortical fixation. I had presented that once uh, during our technology grand rounds. Those uh, high degree dysplastic spondylolisthesis where the L5 was so anteriorly slipped, difficult to reach from any direction. And we just use those uh, long screws that traverse everything, kind of a sideways bowman. And I started doing SI fusions, which is, it almost feels like, you know, it's not part of neurosurgery at all. A picture of Aria doing a, an SI fusion was just butt exposed. You know, we're, we're, we're joking, is it still neurosurgery? Probably not. The patients come with a syndrome, and I feel like we can help them, especially now that we have the robot. It eliminates all of that uh, uh, headaches about trying to navigate and put in the right position. It, it becomes a very easy surgery. It takes about 30 minutes to an hour, um, and, and we get to uh, stay in control of patients' uh, syndrome and see if it helps, not advance further, rather than giving that away to ortho. And then uh, if you add all those numbers up, they don't quite come up to 1,000 because there's all these other cases that are couldn't categorize. Some removal of instrumentation and provisions are a little wacky, but all in all, you can see uh, that the practice, mostly lumbar, uh, a quarter cervical, 8% thoracic, and uh, miscellaneous the other side. So now that was a thousand cases. Uh, can anyone guess? You know, I look back into uh, uh, into my case log, and what I did, I um, thank. I, I would like to thank Dr. Levy for influencing me earlier on and keep the log updated. And I found that very helpful. So pretty much as cases are happening, I put them in. As complication happens, I put that in. That way, my recall bias is almost non-existent. I'm sure there is still some because sometimes there's a lag between when I get to put that those cases in. But I feel like I capture most of the events that need to be tracked. So um, uh, when I look back at this Excel spreadsheet, what I did, I identified patients that are repeat number, uh, name, and ID. So like the same two patients, but were done on the different days. And that's how I found that number. Can anyone guess what this number is out of the thousand cases? How many patients returned to the OR with me? Maybe you can speak from experience, other numbers that you've heard. Cat, Catberry, I see you're on. I'm gonna wake you up. All right. Vignesh, you there? Turkey? Dr. Levy, can you hear me? We can hear you, Timur. Yes. I can hear you, Timur. I'm gonna I can hear you, too. Yeah. I'm going to say... Uh, we can hear you. 0.25%. Oh, you think too highly of me, sir. All right. I'm going to have to disappoint you. So when I identified, when I did this, I found 106 patients that had more than one surgery with me. And I was like, wow, I suck. I don't do anything for the community. So, uh, is, are any of the residents on? I see a lot of names, but as you can see, no one responding. Who do we have? Is Long available? Beautiful. All right, I'm going to keep calling you guys. We'll see who the, who's actually on. Damien, are you on? Good time, I'm here. <laughs> well, good morning, sunshine. Thanks for uh, being logged in and paying attention. So if I had a thousand cases, a hundred of them are patients that you know, I had to repeat. How many patients did not go back to the OR yet? Uh, about 900 or so. <laughs> Eight, 894. <laughs> good. That's just a quick wake up question. Yes. So yeah, 800 patients, because 100 patients got double, right? At least some of them even got two or three. So that's a high number. And that's the whole goal of this presentation. I wanted to check why, you know, what am I doing that patients come back to the OR? Because it's great when things go right and patients come into clinic and they're grateful, they're thankful, and you think you're doing a good job. But as it turned out, one in nine patients here that I see and I sign up for surgery 
seems to be ending up with another procedure. So that's something that I tell to the patients that, oh, you know, you're going to probably have 10% you're going to need another surgery for some reason. So what am I doing wrong, right? And that's that's what the interest of this review was. What can I improve? What can I change? And I started to uh, break down those 106 cases to see what exactly has happened. And here's the uh, number breakdown. So uh, I guess from simpler to complex, 13 patients needed a wound washout. That's when you do something and there's a little abscess that's not improving with antibiotics, outpatient management timing, it keeps getting worse. And we decide to take them to the OR at different times and wash it out, reclose it. So 13 patients like that. Among those, five were microdiscectomies, two ipsychondrous, two laminoplasties, uh, two cervical spine prominotomies, again, small approaches, one of the coxygectomy cases, so one in three, 30% infection on coxygectomy, uh, probably in proximity to the uh, dirty area. And then one case was uh, an open uh, L4 laminectomy. So you can see a lot of these cases, they're more on the simpler side, something that's we consider smaller, quicker, and you know, <laughs> easy operation. And yet we have 13 of them coming back for wound washouts. Uh, as you can see, none of the uh, lists are here, you know, the T10 to pelvises did not make it to this, uh, wound dehiscence problem. So is it because we're less careful with the procedure? Think of it lightly, don't wash our hands as well, or everyone's a little more relaxed. Something to consider, right? So we need to add an extra step of, step of really washing the uh, small uh, openings out. Anyway, so 12 cases, CSF leak repairs. Patient that had the procedure and then come back for a delayed wound breakdown because CSF is just pouring out. And look at over here, the numbers reversed a little bit for uh, the uh, MIS decompressions. Five or less of these CSF leaks are from the ipsy contra surgery. Uh, we see them often in our uh, M&Ms that did the ipsy contra comes back for uh, CSF leak repair. And at least in, in, among the numbers that I have, zero microdiscectomies require CSF leak repair. It's not because we don't get CSF leaks of microdiscectomies, but I think because we're always working directly with that space, and if we see a CSF, we usually repair it right away, and that's, uh, it holds up well. In the ipsy contra surgeries, those leaks are usually hidden in the far corner. Uh, initially, they may be thumping at it, and we don't see it. Or it could be a partial injury to the door, and then it just develops over time, and later on, it becomes more apparent. And then just a myriad of other cases. One of the cold flicks, again, working in a narrow environment, probably makes it more prone to a technical error and uh, catching that door. One of the lateral uh, lumbar carpectomy cases where burst fragments were being pulled away from the thickle sac, two tumors had to be uh, taken back, an ACDF, and two untethering cases. So those are kind of, you know, they're hit and miss, hard to make predictions of them. But the uh, ipsy contra and microdiscectomy, I think, is interesting to look more closely at uh, from that regard. Two hematoma washouts. Uh, those, you know, it's... Uh, what can you do? They, they happen sometimes. One of them was that ipsy contra case, and the other was a large uh, thoracic lipoma case where right, removing the uh, fatty tissue from the epidural space. I think I was too aggressive. I thought, oh, it's just, you know, it's fat above. Let's just uh, woods and everything out, and uh, we're done. So we did it, but it turned out there's a lot of venous plexus within that fat. So we were first dealing with all that bleeding, and then just thought uh, we got it, closed it, but bleeding continued, so we had to take it back. And then uh, four complex wound revisions, and those are really complex where it's, uh, it's you do it once and it doesn't work, you do another one, or you have to remove the hardware. So uh, three of those cases were infection related and one hernia repair, which I'll, I'll show you later. But from the infection, when it comes to that complex category, it is a very dangerous situation. One of those three patients is not alive anymore. She was found dead at home. Uh, for unknown reasons, but I believe it was uh, depression, multiple revision surgeries, and uh, maybe a drug overdose. She was referred to me by a, a northern practice that did the original surgery, and then she wouldn't be healing, so I helped with some of the wash up, but she was never the same. Uh, one of the untethering cases had to be taken back, so remember I did 18 kind of a large untethering procedures, and one surgery needed to go back then couple of weeks. And there it was interesting. We've been using a uh, Vivex Amnion uh, for the last, I think, uh, seven years. And for that one patient, I used uh, Integra Amnion just one time. And I don't know if it's a fluke or 
it, it relates to amnion. But when they came back, everything was scarred in, which is the opposite of what amnion is supposed to be doing. So I can't use that anymore, of course. Uh, nine of these uh, 106 actually popped into that uh, search list because they were uh, staged operations. So I did the surgery on one day, and then the stage that was originally planned on the different day over the couple of days. Uh, those are not really take backs, I guess. So you can subtract the nine from the one, uh, or nine from 106. You know, for the planned operations that were a little bit bigger and required more attention. So I think that's okay. Uh, two of my cases, and that's the one I, I put in the prints that I know of. It's, again, I tried to keep track of everyone, and like, two people required an operation by other service. One lady was a Chiari patient that returning with headaches and they tried to manage it conservatively and then she went to Baptist and got a VP shunned uh, probably for the right reasons maybe I was in denial but or maybe I was trying to get her through that initial period anyway she got the VP shunned at Baptist nothing I could do about it and the other patient was a uh, uh, A-lift procedure with intraoperative uh, uh, venous bleeding that was managed and uh, closed but the patient developed deep venous thrombosis at the uh, common ileic and vascular service had to take him back and Login. And now 35 patients, uh, you know, they popped into this 106, came back uh, for different reasons. So let's say they had a lumbar surgery at one time, and then a couple months later or the next year after, they came back for a cervical procedure. So a lot of them were like that. But there are five that kind of were directly related to a previous procedure that I did. Those five I take personal kind of responsibility for, and that's what I need to to review for myself is it something that I did and I do something different. And the other 30 is actually a good marker, right? I want those numbers to be higher. I want people to come back to us because they've had such a good experience uh, before that they trust us again and they want to do another section, uh, another segment of their body operated on. And then if you think about 30 patients, um, I guess from 900, that puts it at about 3%. And I did the national search and people that have had a surgery before, there's about I think 15 to 30 percentage of them requiring another procedure within five years, or again, unrelated reasons. So if we only get 3% back, where are the other 20 going? Are they not happy that original surgery? Did they not like our uh, preoperative process, getting into the OR? And that's something that can be looked at as a curiosity point. But of course, within those 35, five of them were um, correlated to the previous index surgery, three for adjacent level disease. One had initial uh, small decompression, but then needed a fusion. And same thing with microdiscectomy needing a fusion. All right, so those are the bulk of it, right? And that's kind of some of those things are controllable, some are not. I think uh, for the most part, those numbers will remain the same. The next category is what I find the most interesting. Those are the patients, when I looked at it, they were uh, they, they come, came back almost with the same problems. I, I did the surgery, and it did not help. And now I have to take them back. 28 patients that I would you know, partially say that I mismanaged, mismanaged initially, that maybe my judgment was off, I was too hopeful, but something was off. I, I failed them the first time, they needed another operation. And I further broke those down. So 28 cases. Oh, uh, before that, I want to make a quick note on our simple cases again, because we did talk about it in M&M uh, &M Grand Rounds. For the ipsy contrast, if, if you do the math, math now, out of 63 that I did, we've had two infections, five CSF leaks, one hematoma, and three returns fusion. And that's uh, 10 out of 63 people from ipsy contra pool uh, having some kind of a return to the OR. So that's 16%. And then the microdiscectomy, similarly, out of 61, five infections. One return for fusion would say that six out of 61, which is 10% of microdiscectomy patients meaning to return to the OR. So I guess these are the uh, true numbers that I have right now over the last four years. And that's what I would have to tell my patients uh, moving on in terms of uh, you know, the risk involved. So yeah, those um, cases that we think are simple turn out to be uh, kind of more complex in the long run. Take your guard down. Anyway, back to 28 cases that I believe uh, have failed. So when I further break them down, I get 12 cases that are, were originally done in the uh, uh, lateral position and then later required a posterior revision. Right? It could be done next day, within a couple of days, or within a couple of weeks. So 12 of my uh, lateral cases, and I counted here 12 out of 116, which is combined direct lateral and obliques, which is 10%. And uh, I, I did the search 
for kind of a reporting online, and I get the numbers of 10 to 20 percent return to the OR for lateral cases reported. So I guess that puts me in the average category. Uh, seven of the uh, micro decompressions re result in infusions, and that well, ipsy contra micro discs that puts it at four percent, seven out of 174 together. Uh, and about the same national reported numbers for the 10% that I found in the literature. And then people that had the decompression, but then re needed to go back to the OR to maybe do more decompression or finish decompression. The first one was not sufficient. I get four of those out of 174. That's 2%. Uh, and that's, uh, even though it's probably about the same as national average, you can't tell those numbers from the little smaller pool yet. Uh, when I used to do T-lifts, and part of the reason why I stopped doing it at um, the primary goal to surgery for my single level spondylosis patients, I was, you know, two of my patients had a subsidence, a magic that I had to revise and remove the cage. And I presented that before the size is different between the lateral cage that goes in and place of the T-lift cage that was removed. And then uh, there were three other patients that I did the same thing that came from the outside. So having seen that and also dealing with uh, post-operative issues and uh, uh, one patient where I've injured the uh, L5 neural root by putting the cage in, it was just kind of uh, daunting on me. And I guess that pushed me away from T-lips overall uh, to, more towards lateral. Uh, one of the ACDF required posterior laminectomy, where I think I, I thought I'd get away with a single level of decompression, but patient required more, so I, we had to take him back for a laminectomy through the back. Uh, one of the larger operations, which is those uh, prone positions, open uh, thoracolumbar uh, sacral fusions. Uh, one of those patients I had to take back to uh, for pseudoarthrosis at the next segment of construct. And that's, uh, it's hard to predict whether, you know, it's true representative of failure or not. Uh, and then, of course, one very complex patient that I'll show later on as well. Um, they needed three revisions just I totally messed that up, and I'll share that with you. So you can see, you can see that's a breakdown again. Some of the things I can control, some I can't. Like micro decompression to fusion, you can say that's a natural progression, or you can say that maybe the decompression was too aggressive, and now there's iatrogenic instability that I have caused, and patients require fusion. I can only mo be more careful, right? In those cases, uh, micro decompression to more decompression again insufficient initial decompression would do better. But then the lateral is what's interesting to me because you know, I do a lot of it. I rely on it. I trust it now. Um, and if anything, I've been pushing the, uh, the boundaries of what's acceptable in terms of treating with a lateral disease and seeing the help. For the most part, I've been getting very good feedback and as patients come back for uh, post-operative care, it, it, it's been, there are a lot of nice conversations that we have in terms of patient experience from surgery. But of course, when the bad things happen, they're, they're, they cloud over you. And you think, is it really worth it? Should we just go back to T-lifts and deal with subsidence? Uh, here's, uh, I put some cases together from a, you know, like a series of ways to scrub a lateral case. And I'm gonna share a few of them. Maybe someone will be able to take that out and reduce your own learning curve. Uh, this was a 15 year old woman, had a previous L4 to S1 fusion came back with the back pain primarily. Uh, of course, conservative measures, all of that have been taken. Now we're having a discussion, what else can we do? My evaluation that she's developing an adjacent level disease, I'm seeing facet space enlargement, I'm seeing compression stenosis. These, uh, I consider doing a single level decompression, which we do ipsy contra, and that's if they primarily have neurogenic education, or if I can list case she had a lot of back pain really a lot of back pain relief injections but not too long where i felt it was really the stability issue even though in flexion and extension you cannot prove that there is a major instability uh, but you know, i believe that that's just that's going so i chose to go in the lateral and we did the procedure where uh, you know, it's a single stage initially look on the left uh, that was the original goal place the uh, standalone cage with a lateral plate and secure that has worked for many surgeries, but in this particular one, ALL was inadvertently released. You can see how the retractor shadowing is. You can, it's going from the posterior to anterior. So, and when you stay in the back of the patient and work you know, in the lateral space, you'll be tended to kind of lean away towards abdominal space. So, during one of the steps of decompression, either trialing or uh, 
scraping. I think ALL was released. I did not realize that. And then we put the cage in and we're expanding it. It's an expandable cage. And it just would not torque out. It just kept going and going and going. And that's when I realized that the ALL was released. You can see the difference in the height of the interior between the, uh, uh, the lateral cage and then further down below where the previous fusion was. So when we saw that, we kind of start torquing it. Put screws in and uh, check the motors and everything was stable. When, when she woke up and tried to get up, it was obvious that there was a compressive allergy through the air, uh, that SAP was digging in. And so even the next day, uh, she was not improving and I took her back and we just reinforced through the back. And that helped her, that you know helped overall, but that was not planned. So yeah, watch out for that ALO release, watch out for the angulation of the instrument and which side you stand up. So most of my lateral these days, I do from the anterior, from the belly side. Uh, for many reasons, that gives me a flexibility of angling away, being oblique, and, uh, so all the steps don't change. But of course, now the next case, but well, here the lesson is learned, watch out for ALL. The next case is a 60-year-old woman has a uh, spondylolisthesis associated symptoms and requires a fixation of L4, L5. And that can be done in many different ways. My choice was, again, to go through the lateral. Uh, and then you can see over here the progression of the x-rays. Uh, on the far left, how the uh, retractors, because of the high crest, are sitting more obliquely to avoid the bone, but having direct view of the disc. But here you run the risk of uh, now swaying away in the opposite direction towards the canal, the contralateral neural root. And uh, if you don't account for that angle, you do end up, look at the middle image. Uh, after we did everything, the cage on the lateral view is way posterior. So after doing some readjustment, I was, I was able to push it forward, but that was not enough. Uh, patient did wake up with a contralateral pain. Uh, and then I requ required to take her back. A week later, initially, I guess I was in denial. I'm like, oh, that's just from the distraction. Pain will get better. You'll get better. But as we're watching her, she's not improving. And we took her back, used the tubular system uh, in prone to push the cage forward. And you can see on that CAT scan how now the cage, the cage is rotated and away from the canal. And that helped her. Um, the lessons learned over here. Don't be too greedy with these lateral cases. And that's what I mean by that. If, if These days, if I go between trying to decide 40 or 45 millimeter cage, I just take a lesser one. I don't have to deal with the uh, complication of being too greedy and the longer cage gets in the contralateral space or goes too far. Uh, and of course, the other one is uh, end up developing this concept of red zone in the lateral cases where nothing touches the posterior third of the vertebral body column and any penetration through the disc space, if it's an oblique or off angle, it needs to be done under lateral view, so we know that it's not going towards the canal at all, not being um, biased due to access and angulation of the approach. On the MRIs, just to show you, you can see the uh, uh, degree of direct decompression. Uh, sometimes people wonder, but what about all that stenosis? It does go away. I mean, that's uh, Dr. Uribe published a lot on that, and you can see here in life how uh, the canal opens up by uh, expanding that space. So I, I've shown this slide before. A lot of things can go wrong when you start getting off direct. Uh, even though the femoral nerve and the lumbar plexus may feel more protected, but there's always ways to screw that up. So it's a learning curve and everyone has to be aware of that. And here's one more case that went very well. We were happy and high-fiving each other. This lady came from an outside place, was told that she needs a two-day operation. And I was like, oh, don't worry, we can do it in, in one day. Uh, the surgery itself went well. I think the goals of surgery were achieved. Um, and uh, clinically, she was doing well from that. But at about six months follow-up, she's having this persistent pain over the left flank. Uh, there's, you, you can see on the MRI how there's an out pouch, like a little mushroom going through the uh, abdominal wall. And it was very sensitive to her. When she, she says, when she walks, she feels electrical sensation on the side. If you tap over that area, she feels electrical sensation. And she has also developed a pseudo hernia further down below. So I, I had referred her to uh, general surgery to see if they could help us with that. And for some reason, no one wanted to. They said, no, this is, uh, this is not curable. You, cannot, you can't do anything about it. She continued to be miserable. This is a, an older Russian lady. I mean, a lot, a lot of candid conversations. And in the end, I said, you know what? I believe that there is something that's being compressed. Let, let's go in there. I told her, I've never done that before, but if you're on board, let's do it. So she trusted me again. We went in. 
uh, initially I posted the case as hernia repair. And then everyone started calling me from Jackson and saying that I'm not uh, credentialed for hernia repair. So I had to rename it into uh, ileal window nerve uh, decompression. But the surgery, you know, I just reopened the old incision with one of the access incisions, uh, found the area where it was punching through and uh, reinforced it with allergy, and not helped her, at least in this case. But interesting how general surgery was not willing to help and said that there's nothing to do. To keep in mind. And that's more than one surgeon that said that. So, lesson learned, you know, I don't cut anything in the exposure. I think three of those cages uh, in the lumbar spine went through the same incision. So maybe uh, there was a lot of retraction through the same approach. And uh, more often, if it's more than one or two levels, I choose to re-enter the uh, muscular wall through a different uh, exposure by going in, in fibrous space. I'm aware of time. I know at 7.50, we have to stop for a medical student presentation. We're going to be doing very well. So and here's that case where I completely failed this lady. Uh, I had to take her back three times only because of my initial decision of going smaller, doing less for her. She was about 44-year-old woman. With the, uh, um, you can see the far left image like this and operated on somewhere else. She already came to me with that huge... Construct, I believe it was T7 to a pelvis, and state that she is in a lot of, a lot of pain, cannot be upright, leans forward, and can only walk bend forward. I identified two problems with her, PJK at the uh, level right above the fixation, and the flat back syndrome. I said, oh, don't worry, I can fix both for you. In a less invasive procedure, we don't have to reopen you. And I did that. I opened two spaces, right over the thoracic, one over the lumbar, in prone, uh, at, the, at the bottom. We did a prone lateral access to L4-5. As you can see on that uh, CAT scan, that was a space that did not fuse. Opened that up and placed the bandable cage to give her some lordosis and secured it. And then the upper part, thoracic, I just reinforced the uh, PJK area by adding a couple more levels. But in doing so, I trusted the previous fusion. I thought it was probably done. There's nothing that these uh, rods and screws are doing anymore. So I disconnected those the one long rod because of the limited exposure, I just cut that off and put new rods in each of the segments that I worked on. But over time, she came back saying that she's more forward and then we checked on the imaging and she was breaking over the areas that I disconnected. Uh, and you can see on the far right image, the lumbar separation and then uh, uh, thoracic is not apparent here yet. So as a second surgery, I said, okay, let's go back and reinforce the, uh, uh, the lower segment. I, I did that. Um, and it helped her initially, but then she started to break off over the thoracic spine. Then I had to do another operation on her to reinforce the thoracic segments again. And that's me being too little, kind of too small of an operation. Had I kept all the rods from the beginning, put a little more effort in the beginning, exposed a little more, and kind of kept that construct as a single unit, not trusting the fusion from before, it would have avoided all of that. Yeah, and it's just showing me how she is after third operation when finally everything was locked in, but by now she is in a lot of pain and still miserable. Yeah, so here I learned not to trust any previous fusions. Uh, I remember that from the lessons we learned from a uh, clavicular fixation. I think we removed the plate one from a very old fusion, supposedly, and the clavicle broke. And here I've learned that on my own uh, one more, uh, big spinal fusion case. And here's another case along the lines uh, that sometimes small is just enough. Here's a lady, 50-year-old, that comes in with recent worsening of pain. She's always had chronic back pain that she managed, and she's always had diagnosis of scoliosis. But she said, recently it's becoming really bad. What can we do? Uh, and then uh, I look back in 2012, you can see the image of her scoliosis. She's always had that. And this is the kind of person that she's very active. Uh, she, her whole life she's had the scoliosis she's been managing. She does yoga. She's very kind of a, uh, athletic, but she's asking, what can she do? She cannot take too much time off. She's taking care of somebody at home. Absolutely impossible. So we had a candid discussion, looked at all her different levels, and I felt that that's a segment right above, you see on the middle, coronal CT, that looks different, and maybe that's what destabilized more recently, creating a lot of her pain. And we had a good discussion. I said, let's just fix that. And we did it. And uh, a single stage kind of quick lateral procedure these usually take an hour and a half. She was going home the next day. And what do you guys think happened next? Uh, Damien, you're still on? Yep. So, so you see, I did this kind of a small fixation for her, and now I'm seeing her for a follow-up. 
what do you think predict? Or predict what do you think is going to happen to her? Uh, she'll develop some adjacent segment disease. Probably, exactly, right? And then requiring more surgery. And that's still in the books. You know, at three months, she comes back uh, very happy. Uh, this is her pain drawing, you know, the bigger one on the new uh, visit. She still has that left flank pain, but the original mid-back pain that she circled that was very severe is gone. She's happy. She's back to gardening. Uh, this is a nursing note from assessing her previous symptoms, and she denies weakness, pain in her extremities, and low back pain improving. So the patient is very happy. Uh, within a couple of weeks, she was able to go back to her normal activities, very little downtime, and she knows that she may need to have another surgery, and she accepts that fact, and we do another lateral. So here, just, you know, that it's not all bad in terms of doing those small procedures. Some cases do feel better, but again, nothing, like Dr. Wang says, nothing spoils your uh, outcomes like follow-up, right? This is at six months right now. We're still in the good, but who knows what's going to happen in the future. She may need to have another segment fixed. Now there's a serious like this where I approach these uh, chronic scoliosis patients with just single level fixation, given that relief. And it's interesting how that slight improvement in pain syndrome that they have gives them a lot of quality of life return. Even though it doesn't fix all of their problems, it doesn't make the x-rays look pretty, but patients return and they're happy with, the, uh, with, their, with their status at the time. So just in summary, again, Dr. Levy, thank you for uh, influencing me and in putting the uh, prospect kind of database together. Uh, I keep doing it, and it's, it's very rewarding. I can always look back and find patients and, and cases, and it's also good for uh, uh, publications. Not a lot of the residents took advantage of the database. We can really pull a lot of cases out. There's some good series that are coming out. We have uh, a good series of tandem cases where simultaneous operations in two different areas of the spine are done. Yeah, all kind of cool uh, data available. I think uh, you know I'm learning that complications are inevitable. You know, it, it's it's kind of a common sense. Everyone says that, but when you start seeing it firsthand, how do you address that? I remember that lecture that Dr. Wayne gave us, right, on how uh, psychopathic you are in terms of how many cases you need to get over your complication. 10, 20, 50. and there's some somewhere in the middle zone that I think that should happen, right? That you, you shouldn't kind of be uh, too stressed out about one particular case for too long, but at the same time, you shouldn't disregard it and say, oh, it's okay. Um, and it seems that patients do require a return to the OR. So, and it's something that's important to keep good connection with the patient, good report. Uh, keep in mind that they may need you again. Don't, don't cut those ties. But then they'll probably go somewhere else to another surgeon and start complaining and bad not you. And as you can see, there's a learning curve that I'm going through, but, Within academic, I guess there's also this uh, learning cycle. It's not just a curve. You know, there's a cycle because we go through uh, rotations, new fellows come in, they, you know, July to August, there's difference. And then back to July, we have to step back a little bit, slow down, be a little more involved. So I'm getting more and more aware of that. Like we're in July right now. I, you know, my approach to the OR is not the same as we did just, you know, before the graduating class where you can be a little bit more laid back. So yeah, those are my uh, kind of, uh, pearls, I guess, that I've learned in the last four years. And then again, you know, when Daniel was asking me, he's the best surgeon, I still can't have that answer for him, but I try to kind of take his attention away. And so one day I'll be able to tell yes. All right. I think that's it for me. 751. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm sorry if it was not relevant to uh, what you do or what you wanted to do. This was an exciting opportunity for me to review my four years. Great job, Timmer. Uh, it takes a brave surgeon to come in front of an audience and, and talk about their uh, their complications. And, um, you know, I think that's the best way to learn and, and, and congratulate you on taking on the, the, the database and keeping it up to date. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Brett Gu. I think we're going to have to uh, forego questions for now. Hi, my name is Brett Gu. I'm a fourth year medical student at Yale, and I'm currently on a sub -I. Uh, I'd like to thank the department for the opportunity to present my research and for an incredible sub -I experience. I'll be talking about work I did in the Donnacell lab over the last year, where we studied the human salience network at the single neuron level and its role in threat processing. The threat is any stimulus that has the potential to inflict harm. Threat exists along a continuum in both time and space. 
Threats that are remote in time and space can cause anxiety and worry, whereas threats that are imminent in time and space cause fear and panic. Psychiatric conditions, such as anxiety disorders, including PTSD, are characterized by an improper response to threats. For example, there may be a heightened maladaptive response to non-threatening stimuli, or this response may persist after the stimuli is no longer present. Understanding the neural mechanisms of threat processing are a critical step for developing circuit therapeutics for threat-based disorders. The salience network is a functional network that imaging studies have implicated in threat processing and the salience network has been shown to be overactive in threat-based disorders. It is primarily composed of the dorsal anterior cingulate and the anterior insula. This study aims to study at the single neuron level how regions in the salience network respond to threat appearance, and secondly, to determine how regions in the salience network respond to the outcome of a threat, out of a threat processing task. To study this question, we're using a computer-based task that was validated to cause state anxiety in 400 healthy participants. The patient controls a spaceship that moves only in the up and down direction and undergoes three phases in the task. During the first phase, only the spaceship is present on the screen, and this serves as a baseline period for all further analyses. During the second phase, waves of asteroids move right to left across the screen. Threat appearance is defined as the moment that asteroids initially appear on the screen. In the outcome period, the spaceship is either hit or missed by the asteroids. Getting hit by an asteroid is considered an aversive outcome, whereas successfully avoiding the asteroids is considered a successful threat avoidance. This series of three phases constitutes one trial and the task repeats for 270 trials lasting approximately six seconds each. Shown at the bottom is the task at accelerated playback, where you can see three phases where the asteroids move right to left, and there's either a aversive outcome in which the spaceship is hit or successful threat avoidance. We currently have data from seven patients with medically refractory epilepsy who have intracranial implanted electrodes for the clinical localization of seizures. The location of these electrodes is determined solely by the clinical team. As the patients recover in the epilepsy monitoring unit, they perform the task, and we record both the task data and data from the electrodes. The electrodes contain microwires that record raw data in the form of voltages. We can obtain the waveform of each action potential, also known as a spike, using a program called Combinado. We get the waveform and the time at which each action potential occurs. We detected a total of 155 single neurons across seven patients, 100 in the anterior insula and 55 in the dorsal anterior cingulate. The first step in analyzing the data and visualizing the data is to create two kinds of plots. The top half, these two plots are called raster plots, and the bottom are peri stimulus time histograms. For the raster plot, the x-axis is the time within each six-second trial, where time is zero is such that zero is threat appearance. On the y-axis is every trial, from the first trial to the last trial. As you move across the x-axis, you can see how this one example neuron is firing within the trial. And as you move along the y-axis, you can see how the activity changes over time across trials. To get the plot on the bottom, you aggregate the number of spikes across all trials and bend the trials into 50 millisecond intervals. What you get is on the y-axis is, is the firing rate, which is in units of spikes per second. When you look at the peri time histogram, you can see that this individual neuron is increasing its firing rate following threat appearance, and then it returns back to baseline. On the right half of the screen, the time is aligned, so the zero is the time of the outcome of each trial. When you align to the outcome of each trial, you can see that this individual example neuron is increasing firing rate during aversive outcome trials, 
but not increasing its fire rate during successful avoidance trials. The next step is to determine which neurons are task responsive. We've created heat maps for every region. Every box represents the Z-scored firing rate relative to the baseline for that neuron. Every row represents an individual neuron. So for the anterior infla, there's 100 neurons, and every box represents the Z-scored firing rate within each trial. Neurons that had an increase in firing rate that were over 2.5 Z-scores above baseline were considered task responsive. And we identified a total of 32 neurons in the anterior infla that increased firing rate to aversive outcomes. And only these neurons were used for further analyses. We calculated the change in firing rate relative to the baseline, relative to the baseline, depending on the outcome of the task. The change in firing rate is shown on the y-axis. When aligning time to threat appearance or to the outcome, there's a clear separation between the change in firing rate for aversive outcome trials compared to successful avoidance trials. We then performed a Wilcoxon rank sum test on the change in firing rate, which confirms that for the anterior insulin neurons, these neurons are significantly increasing firing rate during aversive outcome trials compared to successful avoidance trials. We repeated this analysis, the dorsal anterior cingulate. These plots are for one example neuron in the dorsal anterior cingulate. Again, we see that there's an increase in firing rate during threat appearance, and then a return back to baseline. When we separate the trials based on the outcome, either aversive outcome or successful avoidance, we see that this example neuron is increasing firing rate for successful avoidances, but not for aversive outcomes. We again identified which neurons are task responsive and found that a total of 20 neurons in the dorsal anterior cingulate increased firing rate to successful threat avoidance. And we only used these neurons for the further analysis. We calculated the change in firing rate for the different outcomes, either aversive outcome or successful avoidance, and aligned the time to the time of threat appearance or to the time of the outcome. And in both alignments, we see again that there's a significant difference between the two outcomes of the test. For the dorsal anterior cingulate neurons, these neurons increase firing rate for successful avoidance trials, but not as much for aversive outcome trials. When we perform the Wilcox and Rankcom test, these, the test confirms that for the dorsal anterior cingulate neurons, these neurons significantly increase firing rate to successful avoidance of threat but not to aversive outcomes. In conclusion, we found that neurons in the, in the salience network respond to threat appearance by increasing their firing rate, and neurons in the anterior insula increase their firing rate to aversive outcomes, whereas dorsal anterior cingulate neurons increase the firing rate to successful threat avoidance. The next steps of the project are to determine how the neurons respond at the population level, and secondly, to determine how interactions between regions form a cohesive threat response in humans. I'd like to thank the University of Miami for an incredible survey experience, from the residents to the faculty to the staff. Um, thank you to Rita and Gladys for accommodating me uh, off cycle, um, and thank you again for the opportunity to present my research. Uh, I have a large number of people in my lab that I'd like to thank, uh, starting first and foremost with my PI, Dr. Domisov, uh, who made all this work possible. Uh, I'd like to thank Mauricio, Eamon, Neelam, and Leighton uh, for all their help throughout the research process. Um, I'd like to thank my funding sources, uh, YCCI, and last but certainly not least, uh, I'd like to thank the patients who uh, go through so much uh, and we're so gracious to accommodate us and perform the task. And uh, that's it for my presentation. Happy to take any questions.
I think we're going to have to forego questions right now because of the tight schedule, but that was a tremendous uh, presentation and much appreciated. So next we have Shayar. Right. We can hear you and we can see the presentation. You're ready to start. Great. Thank you for confirming. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shayar and I'm from George Washington University. For the past couple of weeks, I've had the privilege of rotating here as a sub eye, And I want to thank you all for allowing me to share my presentation today titled Implications of Epithelial Membrane Protein 2 in Glioblastoma Angiogenesis. This is the research that I've worked towards under the supervision of Dr. Isaac Yang at UCLA. Here's an overview of this presentation. First, we'll go over background information about glioblastoma and anti-angiogenic therapy. Then, we'll discuss our team's previous work and current project. And finally, we'll conclude our findings. Glioblastoma's dismal prognosis is in part due to its highly vascular microenvironment. This process is primarily mediated by VEGFA, and efforts to target this led to the FDA approval of Avastin for recurrent disease. This figure shows the various agents that target the VEGF signaling pathway. Although these drugs have shown to improve progression-free survival, they have failed to improve overall survival as a monotherapy or in combination with chemoradiation. This suggests that glioblastoma activates alternative pathways that enable vascularization despite ongoing anti-VEGF treatment. Therefore, monotherapy is not sufficient in halting tumor growth, and the literature suggests better results when using dual anti-angiogenic therapy. One potential mechanism associated with glioblastoma angiogenesis involves epithelial membrane protein 2, EMP2. This is a tetraspan protein of the GAS3 PMP22 family and physiologically regulates trafficking and intracellular compartmentalization. EMP2's pro-oncogenic role has been well established in gynecological tumors, including breast and ovarian carcinoma. And more recently, our team has found evidence of its role in glioblastoma as well. Previously, our lab showed that increased EMP2 expression in U87 cells correlated with vascularity. The figure on the left shows an immunohistochemistry staining of CD34, a marker of the vasculature, displaying that high levels of EMP2 correlated with angiogenesis. The trichrome stain helps us differentiate the tumor from the surrounding connective tissue. The figure on the right shows the results of our lab's follow-up study in 2020, reporting that high EMP2 expression in glioblastoma patients treated with Avastin correlated with worse overall survival. Notably, the increase in EMP2 expression correlated proportionally with longer duration of Avastin treatment, suggesting that EMP2 may be involved in the development of anti-VEGF treatment resistance. When I joined the lab, we wanted to expand on our data by analyzing EMP2 levels before and after anti-VEGF treatment. Our methodology consisted of injecting the SP28 cells into mice subcutaneously. This was followed by weekly treatments with aflibercep, known by its brand name ILEA as our anti-VEGF agent, and serum IgG for the control group. We then excised the tumors for more analysis. We assessed the response to treatment based on tumor growth and weight. The left graph shows that there were no significant difference in tumor growth between the control and ILEA-treated cohorts up to 45 days post-implantation. This is supported by the figure on the right, as tumor weight on the last day was also similar between the two groups. Aligned with the data of glioblastoma patients treated with Avastin, our results validated that anti-VEGF monotherapy is not effective in halting tumor growth. Building on our prior experiments that had shown an upregulation of EMP2 in patients' tumors following Avastin treatment, we used IHC to see if this can be replicated. The top slide shows high levels of EMP2 with ILEA treatment as shown by the brown signal, while at the bottom, we see a significantly lower expression of EMP2 in the control cohort. These results suggested that similar to patient tumors, there's an upregulation of EMP2 following anti-VEGF treatment. 
This was important because it showed that our murin models can be used as a surrogate for human disease. But these results were only observational. So our next step was to investigate if EMP2 can be a therapeutic target. Our second experiment was very similar in that we utilized ILEA as our anti-VEGF agent, but we also modulated EMP2 by forcing overexpression and causing a knockdown. The thought here was modeling the ideology of a multimodal approach, EMP2 can be targeted as an adjunct to anti-VEGF treatment. Our hypothesis was that EMP2 knockdown will improve tumor sensitivity to treatment, and conversely, its increased expression will cause resistance. We use tumor growth and weight as our measures in response to treatment. The left graph shows tumor growth in each group relative to their controls, which were tumors with similar EMP2 genetic modification that did not receive ILEA. The notable findings here are the, as shown by the gray line. EMP2 knockdown increases sensitivity to anti-VEGF treatment, as evidenced by the reduced growth. And conversely, its overexpression is associated with resistance as these tumors had a similar growth rate compared to their controls. This is also shown on the right, as tumor weight in the knockdown cohort was lower than the control and the overexpressing. The improved effectivity of ILEA with EMP2 knockdown highlights this gene as a potential angiogenic target, and the lack of expression in the overexpressing group suggests its involvement in treatment resistance. Additionally, we searched public cancer databases to correlate more glioblastoma data. The information was first imported into our studio using data transfer tools and categorized into clinical and genomic data. The Cancer Genome Atlas was used to correlate between EMP2 and overall survival. C-Bioportal was used to analyze EMP2 expression with hif alpha and VEGF. The reason for choosing these genes was that we believe EMP2 signaling mechanism is greatly intertwined with the hif alpha vegf access. Through CBioPortal, we performed linear regression analyses between these genes. Amongst the 616 tumors, EMP2 and HIF1 alpha mRNA significantly correlated, while EMP2 and VEGFA showed a trend. This is a pattern that we have seen repeatedly in our group's work on human glioblastoma cell lines and have also noted similar trends in our mouse models. Survival analysis in a TCGA cohort of 157 patients was done by stratifying tumors into high and low EMP2 expression based on the medium value. This survival curve shows that high EMP2 expression significantly correlated with poor overall survival. Specifically, the high EMP2 cohort had a median survival of 12.4 months, as opposed to 16.8 months in the low expression group. Together, these databases suggest EMP2's involvement as an angiogenic gene with clinical significance. In summary, we found that targeting EMP2 may be a suitable adjunct to anti-VEGF treatment in mirror models. These findings have the potential for clinical application, as the current literature is trending towards an emphasis on multimodal therapies. Multiple studies have reported favorable results when using two agents targeting the VEGF pathway or coupling an anti-VEGF drug to another biologic that antagonizes a different angiogen, such as angiopoietin-2, or platelet drive growth factor. Additionally, through TCGA and C Bioportal, we found EMP2's association with worse overall survival and a positive correlation between EMP2 and angiogenic genes. This recapitulates our findings in mouse models, highlighting the clinical relevance of this gene. Our proposed mechanism of EMP2 signaling is illustrated on the right, as we believe it initiates a signaling cascade through the FACUS RC pathway which eventually induces the expression of hif alpha and VEGF. Our next steps are to replicate these results using anti-EMP2 monoclonal antibody instead of the viral vectors, as this will better represent the value of targeting EMP2, and also use intracranial implantation since our results are limited by subcutaneous models. I want to thank the organizations that generously supported this work, my mentor, Dr. Yang, the members of our team, and our collaborators in the Wadera Lab whose efforts made this work possible. Thank you all for your time. On a personal note, I've had a fantastic experience here so far and want to thank the entire department, especially the residents for having me and helping me along the way. I'm happy to take questions. 
Very nice presentation. We're going to have to take questions offline so that uh, Dr. Gracioli has sufficient time for his presentation. That was excellent. Thank you. All right. So thank you very much for the opportunity of being with you this morning and speak about one thing that I love most, the management, the management, management of pain. So for those who don't know me, I'm Joe Gracioli, faculty in the department. Um, I focus on functional neurosurgery and trauma neurosurgery and pain and spasticity is what we're going to talk this morning. Uh, it, it's a great combination, actually. Uh, Tim was speaking before me because it's been nothing but a pleasure to work with him in all those years. When I first came to Miami, he was finishing his training. And so far, it's been really a great experience working together and contributing. So I have no disclosures. I Since we all want to start our days I try to make it uh, interesting and fast and light, the presentation, so we'll, I'll keep the, the attention. So we're gonna go quickly about some concepts, some key concepts in neuromodulation for pain, different approaches for spinal neuromodulation, patient selection is paramount if the, to the success of this approach. We are gonna see surgical procedures and discuss some cases, all right? So the way I see a patient that comes with spinal pain uh, is like building a house. When they come to the office, I think that like in a house, first come, uh, the carpenters come, they build the house. We, we need a solid foundation with good walls and a roof. And then we look into the wiring, right? Same thing. The first thing we have to do when a patient comes with spinal pain or spinal related or adjacent pain is to rule out structural abnormalities like neurocompression, instability, or neoplasm. And if all those are ruled out, if there is no indication for a spinal intervention, then we think about neuromodulation. If the residents can take this message away home today, uh, there is nothing to, to operate on the spine. We have nothing to offer, no. We, we, we need to consider neuromodulation. If you can remember that, I'll be glad already. So it's always important to understand that typically uh, the old concepts were that for pain, you do simple energetics, then uh, weak opioids, and you go up the uh, WHO ladder. But this was designed for pain, uh, cancer-related pain. This is modified. This has been, it has been modified. And for non-cancer non pain, it's different. We definitely uh, consider neuromodulation before strong opioids because we know about the crisis we, we are facing, not only in, in the U.S., but in the entire world. And this is typically a, a one-way road. Once the patients are in, uh, in high doses of strong opioids, they have central sensitization, and, and even neuromodulation or other approaches, they typically fail. So we definitely need to avoid strong opioids. We need to, as, as much as possible, uh, we need to think about neuromodulation first. And how does it work? It's not only uh, a matter of changing the, the, the electric pattern, the electrical conduction of the pain. We have profound changes that happen at a, at a cellular level, at, a, at an immuno and genetic response. We're gonna see in details down the road. But before that, it's important to remember that the pain may have different components. So let's review this concept quickly. So nociceptive pain is basically the pain that is related to uh, actual or a potential tissue injury. Like when you hammer your finger, you experience pain because tissue has been injured, right? Like a spine fracture. That's clear when you have uh, an injury. And neuropathic pain is quite the opposite. When nociceptive pain is physiologic pain, we can say that, neuropathic is the opposite. Is when you have... Uh, lesion in any in any level of the neural system. It can be peripheral nerve, spinal cord, or, or uh, brain. Uh, and you have a dysfunction in the, the perception, meaning you have abnormal currents perpetuating pain. And another key concept I'd like to discuss with you this morning is uh, this nomenclature. It's been a couple of years. It was introduced, the concept of, and the designation of persistent spinal pain syndrome. And it's nice to make the analogy with CRPS, com complex regional pain syndrome, in type one and type two, like CRPS. If you have a, a nerve injured, uh, if you don't have, it's CRPS type one. If you don't have surgery on your spine, it's PSPS type one. 
Not PS4. PS4 is the, is the video game. PSPS type 1, when you don't have surgery. And PSPS type 2 is when you had surgery and you still have persistent pain. Okay? And we need to go further. For instance, PSPS type 2 or the, or the, the old uh, known as feedback surgery syndrome. Is it nociceptive pain? Is it neuropathic pain? It's, in fact, it is mixed pain. Uh, when you have a combination of those factors. Please keep in mind that PSPS or feedback surgery syndrome has a, a designation as mixed pain because this will be important to understand how the mechanisms for neuromodulation or neurostimulation work to, to treat this condition. Pain in the, in the human being it typically triggers emotional responses. I, I mean, it, only psychopaths, I guess, can experience pain and don't have a response. Uh, and, and people respond differently. Some people might even use it as a motivator to accomplish some tasks, but others, but typically people get angry. Uh, they have fear, they have depression, anxiety. Around 80 to 85% of the patients with chronic pain have psychiatric comorbidities. So that's important to remember. And when we, we talk about structure, the, the lateral pathway is responsible, the, sp the spinothalamic tract is responsible for the somatic pain, the sensation of pain itself, like, it burns, it tingles, it, um, uh, it's tearing, it's throbbing. And the emotional component is related to the limbic system via the spinoreticular tract, also called as medial pathway. Let's keep that in mind. Also, we have two kinds of neurons related uh, on the pain pathways. We have tonic firing neurons and burst firing neurons. They have a different pattern, but they're both involved in pain generation. Therefore, this approach was created to use uh, a signal that was modified, unbalanced charges to create a powerful discharge to propagate the stimulation, ascending, reaching the brain, reaching the, the, the some of the sensory cortex, the lateral pathway, but also the, the medial pathway to treat emotions. And it was demonstrated in EEG and PET studies that it reaches the anterior syndrome, meaning, uh, uh, the limbic system system is involved. So this approach I like to use, it helps with emotions as well. When you have a, a relevant component of depression, anxiety, catastrophization is very often, often seen. So this is a, a, a nice approach also called called burst DR simulation, who's uh, the person that invented Dr. the reader. And it was compared to the use of the burst DR simulation, the stimulated medial and lateral pathways compared to the tonic simulation, the, 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 the initial stimulation that that started decades ago. Uh, and this, it is called Sunburst Study. And it was just interesting to see that more than 70% of the patients indeed preferred the burst DR instead of tonic because um, it can not only treat emotional and some, some sensory component, but also we can treat the neuropathic component and the nociceptive component. Remembering that PSPS2 is a mixed pain syndrome. Tonic stimulation is more efficient for the neuropathic pain. But we know that that's just part of the problem, right? And then I found this cartoon in a, in a website for kids in the, from the, the WashU. So the glial cell talking to a neuron, hey, why doesn't anyone talk about me? You don't do anything, it's just there. That's not true, read this page. So uh, somebody thought about it. And how about the glia? Because the, the so far designed approaches, they are targeting the neurons only or mostly. Uh, but a genius called Dr. De Reader, uh, Dr. Um, Vallejo, Ricardo Vallejo, decided to pay attention to the to the role of the glial cells in the in the pain generation and perpetuation. And indeed, uh, they are re related to in, uh, inflammatory, including immune and including inflammatory response in the in the pain process. The the their interaction with neurons is unbalanced by a disruption in synaptical response. And it is a, it's a very elegant target and very interesting because if you think that 90% uh, in the brain and even more in the spinal cord uh, uh, of this, uh, in, the, in the gray matter in the spinal cord are, are glial cells. So, and they are implicated in the, in the pain circuitry. So with this approach also called a multiplexed or multi-target approach. So those are, some of the publications of Dr. Vallejo. So based on, he's an immunologist and anesthesiologist. So um, 
using an approach targeting different areas, focusing uh, with different frequencies, focusing on the glia, uh, and trying to rebalance the interactions, the transcriptomic basic uh, results showed that the hypersensitivity to mechanical thermal um, stimuli are reduced, the, the interactions were rebalanced, and gene expression was changed, favoring a better pain control. And in fact, this is an interesting study, like 12 months after starting. This is, that's a recent approach. Um, if you look at, at the comparison of the DTM approach with the, uh, with the traditional tonic stimulation, a responder rate of eight, over 85, 80% compared to around 50% was observed with, with significant improvements in pain, in disability, quality of life, and patient satisfaction. Those are great numbers. It's too bad that we don't find the literature comparison across systems. We all, they are only compared to the old ways to stimulate using tonic stimulation. I, I don't think we're going to see any soon head-to-head -head comparison with different systems, which are um, basically comparable. But then comes the question, spinal cord stimulation, is it only for field back surgery syndrome or PSPS type 2? Not really. And we have an interesting trial that just came up with the results in patients with uh, PSPS type 1. I remember from Timur's last presentation, not today, but the last, uh, the, one, the last one, and he was uh, described that the sensation that you often see, like the majority of the patients you see in the clinic, they are not surgical candidates. And then you feel like you, you wanted to do more instead of just referring, not just referring, but uh, uh, referring to, to uh, other specialties for rehab and injections. And in fact, we can, we can offer more. Uh, that's what this, this result, uh, this, this trial is suggesting. It, it was done in patients. Th that's very important, the, the cr selection criteria. In patients with more than 12 years of uh, back pain, low, low back pain, okay, that had abnormalities in the, in the image. And of course, you're not going to do this for pristine spine, uh, but they had no surgical degenerative disc disease, spondylosis, stenosis, some scoliosis. So patients that don't really meet surgical criteria, but they are miserable. They, are, they have impaired quality of life and pain or uh, medication. So it's a significant number of uh, patients that were involved. And the results of this study showed like uh, a very promising uh, avenue comparing like the, the ODI fell from, uh, from 54 patients on the best medical treatment group to 22. And the average of pain in the numeric rating scale from 7.6 to 2.3. And also, and especially most of the patients were profound responders. That's good. And also emo the emotional improvement, remembering that this targets the remedial pathway as well. So it's, I think it's promising. It's a little early to start doing like um, too much. Of course, it's selections is still very uh, keen. We need to be keen on the selection on this approach. Uh, and again, okay. So as spinal cord stimulation works well for, uh, for spinal related pain. But is, is this the only indication? It's not. It's not. Uh, if you, I, I removed this, I, 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 co I compiled this from the Medicare website. The indications approved for spinal cord stimulation are not only uh, lower back pain, but also CRPS, type 1 and 2, phantom limb, which is clearly neuropathic, we know, peripheral artery disease where reverse, when revascularization was done but it's insufficient or failed, meaning advanced case. It increases the, the rate of uh, limb salvage, um, post-herpetic neurology, grave indication, cord equina injury. Sometimes we have discs that injure the, the, the cord equina. It's decompressed, but still the patients have neuropathic pain. Incomplete spinal cord injury. That's interesting. And I'm going to go back in the end of the presentation. And plexopathies, mostly post-radiotherapy. How do we do that? So we have basically two approaches. We can do percutaneous or open. Okay, the percutaneous approach, uh, sometimes people say, oh, it's just a needle, uh, it's simple. We, we do it like you're awake in a clinic, boom, it's not, it's not going to hurt. I don't know about that. I typically do my case under, uh, uh, with asleep patients. Okay, uh, there is even uh, this beautiful study from Falowski. He's a neurosurgeon, uh, specialized in spine deformity, actually. And Ashton Sharam is also a neurosurgeon, uh, Thomas Jefferson. So they published that patient satisfaction, lead migration, side effects, and treatment failure uh, it's worse when you do a, uh, awake procedures because you need to be faster. You have less time to precisely locate your, your leads. I mean, I like the approach and the patients are super happy, uh, super happy after uh, just waking up with a, the like well positioned. We 
of course, I do interoperative mon monitoring to confirm and, and to test the, the, the elect electric location. So how do we do? The percutaneous approach is basically you go into a needle, meter to the pedicle, you try to enter as close it, uh, at the midline as possible. And then when you, you have the feeling you entered, you swap to the lateral, you confirm your dorsal in the canal, you don't want to be ventral, you want to stimulate the, the sensory pathways, right? So then you continue driving up, like an endovascular case, you use fluoroscopy and then you, you keep guiding your, not your catheter here, but your electrode up to the, your target, which is typically around T8, T, uh, T7, T9, depending on the patient you want to stimulate, and then you put your second lead. Um, this can be done uh, for, for the spine, cervical spine as well. I remember this case, uh, Vic and I, we did, it was a very interesting case, and this patient that came with an, an ACDF done with still massive axial pain, well, what could we offer? We offered to do a, a, cervical a cervical spinal cord stimulation trial, and we were very su successful. So the way it's done, uh, as well as in the lumbar approach, we do it in the cervical approach, loss of resistance technique, when you have uh, a glass syringe, when you, you, you feel the air resistance, when you feel it's lost, then you swap your syringe for your electric, you gently try to introduce, and it's tricky, it's, it's not 100%. I had cases in, in, in which I felt the pop from the flavum, but the resistance was not lost, I don't know, maybe too much fat in the epidural canal, but then what I did, I, I rely on the feeling of going through the flavum, and then I try gently to put the lead, if the lead goes, I don't go further, and I do the x-rays and I move forward, that's important for for, for, for who's beginning the, the approach. So we did it. We, we placed one lead and then the second. We had a nice result. Uh, we do an interoperative testing in every case to, to check the bioimpedances, if the leads are intact and the, the dermatomal coverage, lead anchoring. Uh, Vic was so happy he was relating about it, um, uh, even saying that the ACDF plate helped us to locate. It was nice. Uh, and But yeah, Joe, but, uh, so what's the difference? Why don't we do everybody percutaneous, right? Why do we need, we have to do a paddle or the opposite? Why don't we do it just, we cut to the chain, we put where we have to be. We don't need to steer all the way with the, the risk related. So let's understand what's the difference in the approaches. When you start simulating using a paddle electrode, remember that the contacts are just facing towards the spinal cord, right? So it's very efficient. I mean, in terms of energy efficiency, it's very good, the, uh, the ratio. So as you increase the stimulation, you, you increase the stimulation field, uh, you you're saving energy. You're focused on the uh, on the the, post the posterior column where where you want to target. Whereas the use of a percutaneous lead, you induce like an a uh, sort of spherical stimulation field. So you're wasting energy. You stimulate the flame on the on the dorsal more dorsal aspect. You don't want that with uh, non rechargeable systems. That's a that's a problem because you need to 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 go, come back sooner for a battery change. And also another problem is when you're using tonic. Uh, the way you expand, you don't reach deeper layers as you as you would you, you'd want with a with a pedal, and, and as you expand, you reach the 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 rootlets and, and the posterior dorsal lateral sulcus, so and then you have side effects. So in theory, this uh, th those are advantages. In addition to less migration rate, it's, it migrates much less than those free floating leads in the in the spinal canal. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, this study showed that pedal trials, they have a much higher conversion rate uh, to a permanent implant, meaning they were successful. But of course, this was made by surgeons, so we always like that, but in theory, one could claim that. So how do we do that? That's a video we did of uh, a pedal placement. So we take advantage of the interlaminar space. There is the, there is the need for some bone drilling, uh, a minimal... Uh, removal of bone to expose the flavum, and then gently the flavum is exposed under optical magnification. You can do with microscope or without, you can do with a leaven blade or with a curette and then with a kerosene one. But the goal is to expose, to see the epidural fat do hemostasis, and you want to place, that's the, the template, you want to place it under the fat. Remember that, guys, when you're doing it. You don't want to be on top, you don't want to be on top of the epidural fat because you want to increase and maximize your contact with the dural surface for the simulation. So the, the first thing I do when I, I have the approach uh, completed is to place this uh, this rubber template, uh, uh, pedal template, which is very flexible to see if there would be need for some uh, uh, more exposure. Like in this case, we took a little more from the lateral aspect and to see if nothing's bleeding to be very sure. And then we place the, 
the petal. It's it's a, actually very elegant and a gentle procedure. It needs to be done very careful. And, it's, and never forget to have a, a thoracic spine MRI before implanting that because you don't want to have the surprise of having a, some sort of compression spinal cord. And then you put a petal in and then you have a you can have a spinal cord injury. Okay? Remember that we typically do, of course, uh, with the patient asleep and monitoring. Okay. So, uh, pedal is indicated like primarily implant of a pedal for a pedal trial in cases when we have co a complex uh, previous fusion where, uh, where the, the percutaneous approach is not indicated. So, uh, what, uh, so those are three cases uh, we presented lastly and we, we sent for publication. Uh, patients with complex fusions in which we did like a retrograde approach, different from this one that was anterograde, to place the pedals. We, we, we had uh, a successful placement. Um, we really no no further uh, issues compared to the, the regular one. So that's an approach, even for patients with longer, including T7 uh, fusions. And um, this case I'd like to bring because it's another interesting approach for pedals. For instance, this patient with six, uh, this male with 62 years old came uh, with refractory cervical pain. Okay, had a previous ACDF, and came to me with uh, no 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 surgical indication we don't need we don't need to we don't see instability or a major compression that would require like a decompression to they wouldn't help for to target pain but but there are some stenosis here if you can see for uh, for a percutaneous they even tried a percutaneous trial which was uh difficult so they referred for a pedal placement and if you see the mri uh, it's very rare to see a stenosis on c1 c2 at this area so with that in mind and thinking about the somatotopy of the fibers and Nearest on the on the, on the the posterior horn, the dorsal uh, the, the dorsal horn. Uh, then we came up with the with the plan of implanting a retrograde C1, C0, C1 pedal. If you see here, it's a very small approach with 3.5, 4 centimeters tops, with aid of uh, optical magnification, in which uh, I identified C2 typically, and then I placed a retrograde pedal C1, C2. And it's a very powerful thing. So you can uh, you can really stimulate the coverage. It goes up to the hand. It's not. It's great for axial control, but also appendicular pain. And this case was done. Uh, I like to secure to the element of the C1 the 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 cable, and then we we did a, we had a, a great result. In this patient, he's he's very happy with that. So to feel to finalize, let's talk a little bit about dorsal root ganglion stimulation as well. DRG stim. Okay. So remember, we have this little sphere here that's connected to the dorsal rootlets, okay? And the dorsal, the, the DRG is also called the nerve brain because you have neurons there, really, pseudo unipolar neurons that are connected, not, not only to the periphery, bringing the input, but also connected to the dorsal horn. Uh, via GABAergic receptors. So they modulate the perception and the pain uh, on the dorsal horn. So it's a very interesting target. They have uh, high threshold mechano sensitive uh, channels uh, that are deeply involved in the nociception process. So, and when we have like a nerve injury or when we have like a, a nerve root compression that causes an injury, so we, we have the DRG very uh, uh, profoundly related to the pain generation and perpetuation. So studies showed that there are changes in the uh, properties of int integral membranes uh, uh, of the DRG, uh, the expression of those membranes and the, and the, and the genes, uh, like in the transcription, the, the mRNA transcription. So it makes a very interesting target because what happens is that the DRG in patients with chronic pain that are related to peripheral injuries uh, they're very excited. They are, they're firing like crazy. So, and that's, that's, and this carries the majority of the, of the pain process. So if we can calm down those neurons by means of, uh, an, an electrode delivering electric current, trying to create a high filter path for those, uh, aphatic currents of, of all those, even excit excitotoxic, uh, st stimuli. That's a great approach. Uh, the best indication by far is CRPS. Uh, this this is this trial called Accurate Trial involved 152 patients split in two arms where the efficacy of spinal cord stim and DRG were compared 
and it, the success with DRG was over 80 percent compared to around 55 percent of the spinal cord steam. And there are ad additional advantages, not only pain control, but you have less postural variation because the electrodes are, are less mobile. They are within the, the foramen. Um, and you had greater improvements in quality of life and psychological disposition in patients uh, uh, that underwent DRG steam implant compared. And how do we do that? It's percutaneous. Okay. Uh, although uh, open approach was described uh, even by an upcoming fellow, uh, functional fellow, current pediatric fellow, Dr. Piedade. Uh, so he, he published about an, an open approach for DRG steam, uh, but it was for virgin backs. For patients that had large fusions, it's difficult to to, to stimulate the DRG, but it's not impossible. We, I'm gonna show a case down the road. Uh, but typically the best indications is like, like this patient, uh, that's a male patient, 59 years old, that underwent a uh, laparoscopic resection of a colon cancer lesion. Uh, and then unfortunately uh, there was injury, injury to the um, lumbosacral plexus. So he, he experienced a, 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 a profound motor and sensory deficit with clear neuropathic pain. So it, it is CRPS type two, you can consider that causology, right? So, but the, his spine was pristine. I mean, so that was a great target. So again, a percutaneous approach, this has to be perfect in midline, otherwise it's not gonna work. And, and your angulation needs to target already the, the foramen you're gonna implant. So it's a different angle, okay? So once you get the epidural approach, uh, you implant, you have your sheet, you implant your lead, and you need to create those coils, like a, a cranial and a caudal loop, to, to have a lot of strain relief and keep it in, in the in the spinal canal. And then same thing, you can do a perm try or a, or a regular try, you anchor, and then that's the final aspect. Oh, I implanted three leads to to, to cover the, all his pain. He had a tremendous result, that was nice. Uh, but the DRG placement can be challenging, especially in this case. Uh, it's interesting that Timur showed his case of coccygodinia when he, and the, uh, that he resect the coccyx, but unfortunately, not a great re uh, uh, improvement was uh, accomplished. That's uh, exactly a, a, a case that we implanted for a patient with chronic coccygodinia. Uh, but th the former cases I did, um, it, it is challenging in terms of loc locating the foramen of S3 and 4 with fluoroscopy. Uh, S1 is easy, like that's what we'd commonly do, but three and four is challenging. You don't see much of the x ray and the ang angulation. It took me time to do so. I, I thought about maybe we do a, 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 a more refined approach. And then we came up with the idea we do this navigated. And it worked like a charm, straight to the point, boom, to find the entry. It, it might seem as an overkill, but it's quick. I mean, you, you, implant, you implant the reference, you spin, and you have it. And so what took the most time in the procedure was to locate in the previous case. So it was a I think it was, it's valid. We published this uh, this different approach, and then so S3 and S4 leads uh, I implant we implanted um, uh, to to treat the patient. Had uh, it was the, the pain was seven to eight, and it went down to two and three, like uh, like six months later. It was persistent the, the efficacy. So and we can combine approaches. That's nice. This case came to me, the patient unfortunately had a, a, an L5 injury with a drop foot and it's excruciating uh, radicular pain. Like really, he was getting, he was uh, miserable. And, and then uh, initially I did a trial and implanted a, a spinal cord stimulation system. He improved significantly, but it was still, he, he couldn't function very well. He was still a little depressed and the pain was still severe. It was still like a six to set, a six around. And then, that's my point. Uh, you, you cannot uh, place uh, DRGs when it's instrumented. You don't get the epidural approach. It's scarred. So thinking about the, the, the interconnection that the lumbar plexus has, I decided to, to implant an S1, which is a different approach. You just go for the foramen of S1, which, is, which even if you fuse S1 in your construct, you have the foramen visible. And then it was done. It was really not complicated. And with the S1, S1 the DRG steam leads implant, he improved. He was really happy. Like the pain was mostly uh, two and on occasion even one. So he was super happy with that. So you can combine like spinal cord, spinal cord and DRG implant. Um, yes. And this is what, uh, this is what I wanted to say. Some people say, yeah, it works in the beginning, Joe, but then it, it fades away. Not true. Look at this study. It, it's interesting because it's from Finland. 
we know in Scandinavia, they really can have solid data. They have a, a close uh, follow-up. They, they have uh, uh, like less centers. They have a, a solid follow-up on the patients. And even with old technologies, with tonic stimulation, uh, 20, 22, uh, to, uh, 224 uh, consecutive patients, uh, they were observed for uh, the long term. And after many years of, of uh, follow-up, even more, over 70% of patients had a uh, we're profiting from spinal cord stimulation with the uh, old way to stimulate with tonic stimulation. Okay, so uh, it's really not like the what well, the problem is that uh, too many people, in my view, are implanted with and uh, and some of them are not implanted. We use strict selective criteria, so people are implanted, and then if, even the patients with some psychosomatic uh, conditions or some other form, they they get better in the beginning, given placebo or whatever, and then they and then they experience uh, a decay in the in the efficacy. So again, selections is very important. I, I take my time talking to the patients. You cannot just come, boom, do it. It's, it's, it's different than structural approach. You need to understand the patient. If the patient is solid, and we'll be really proud from, for that. Okay. Well, so, uh, the last two slides in the presentation, I, I just wanted to, to bring the attention of maybe the rest and the students that, that would be interested in, in functional neurotrauma, neurotrauma research. This, this is growing. Uh, uh, last month, I was in Austin for the National Trauma Society meeting, and it, it's really growing the the approach to combine. And, and it's great because Dr. Jagan and I we're both trauma and functional, so I think we have a, we have a, a great uh, environment here to develop further approaches to for uh, to towards this goal. For instance, spinal cord injury and uh, and spinal cord stim can be, uh, it can be used not only for uh, pain. Management, but more recovery. Look at this small series, but promising. Seven patients that were in Asia A, all of them except for one, for years, like over seven years um, of, of like complete injury. Okay. They regained volitional movement. It's not that you're stimulating, it's moving like automatic. No, volitional movement. Okay. Uh, and, and also they, they improved explicitity, pain, but. Um, they, they, they are, we're regaining function. Then, then you think, no, that, that, that's not possible. Come on, it's Asia A, it's complete spinal cord injury. And that's another point I'd like to, to, to bring the attention to is that the concept of, of complete spinal cord injury is being ch has been challenged, except for complete transection of the, of the spinal cord, which is rare. Uh, more and more, there is evidence showing that there is kind of always residual tracts that we can explore. Uh, to explore the, the, maxim, the maximum potential for recovery. Uh, Dr. James Guest uh, recently submitted two NIH grant uh, applications. Let's see if we were funded, we can do more than that. And, um, and also for TBI research, okay, again, functional trauma TBI research, this, for, for example, this, this study with cervical, a high cervical spinal cord stimulation, it can be done with, with percutaneous or paddles. Uh, these six patients, um, they improved really level of consciousness. They were able to move like Ruby's cube again, and some of them started to walk again. They were in a minimal consciousness state for over an, over an year, like not, not vegetative, but minimal consciousness in which you have some level of like minimal commands. They would follow intermittently, but like but it's still a poor GOSE. Uh, they regain consciousness. It's not a miracle, of course, and it's not normal, but it's it, it, it's uh, sensible the improvement in more uh, more improvement and uh, level of consciousness. And uh, in other domains, it was observed as well, like cerebral blood flow uh, and spasticity. You see the Ashworth scale, uh, the cerebral blood flow, uh, BIS and EEG, like electrophysiological analysis, showing a change in in, in the background um, pattern. Uh, and the improvement was continuous over the. The year that they were followed up, and it was sustained after discontinuation of the stimulation. Meaning, the neurostimulation uh, changes the neuroplasticity, and, and those changes they 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 are, they are profound and sustained. So to sum up, I hope there there are people still <laughs> in the Zoom call watching. Um, so if you don't have structural issues to repair, consider neuromodulation. It's not, no, we don't have anything to offer. We do, we, we really do. Neuromodulation for pain. Remember that guy, please. Uh, really, let's try to avoid, let's try to avoid as, soon, as much as possible strong opioids and definitely neuromodulation comes before it, strong opioids. When I say strong opioids for the juniors, like tramadol and codeine are, are weak opioids. Except for that, 
Everything else are strong opioids, okay? Like Percocet, Vicodin, uh, the lot. So spinal cord stimulation is, is, is effective and helpful for low back pain and cervical pain, okay? Axial or appendicular, with or without radicular component. Spinal cord stim is, it can be a good option for PSPS type 2 and 1, like failed back surgery syndrome and virgin backs, okay? But if you have a clear dermatomal distribution or nerve distribution, if you can name the nerve or the, the nerve root one or two or three even, but it's, it's you can determine where it is and you have access to the foramen, DRG is your choice. It works, it works great. Okay. Uh, and of course, for CRPS, um, DRG is, is typically the best indication. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. And I hope we can do more for our lovely patients here in Miami. And uh, if I can stop sharing, I'd be more than glad to answer some questions you might have. If there's somebody there, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Uh, I agree. Neuromodulation work, I saw it firsthand. You helped a lot of my patients that I've messed up. So I appreciate it. Thanks for what you do. Thank you so much, brother. It's always a real, real pleasure. And thanks for, and I thank you. Uh, we work together here at the VA and I'm constantly learning from you and looking forward to learn more and more and to contribute, not only you, and but every, everyone in the department. All right. I wish you all a great day. Thank you. And you had lots of people listening. Awesome. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Landy. Have a great one. You too.